Okay, uh, now I'm going to introduce you to the Lloyds Banking team. So we have Caroline, we have Craig, and we have Mark, and they're going to talk through uh, their experience with using virtual reality in financial services. Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Right, uh, the guy that asked the soft skills question, yeah. So um, listen up, because this is about soft skills. So um, this is your use case. So um, I work for Lloyd's, I'm the digital le lead in within learning. Um, I've got the slide quicker because of that, so I'm not sure that's a good thing. Um, so let's do a whistle-stop tour of our journey in VR. So 14 months ago, we didn't have VR in Lloyd's Banking Group. Now we have three soft skills-based VR um, scenarios within seven face-to-face -face courses. They focus on resilience, presentation skills, and relationship management. Resilience, pretty hot topic in the room? Yeah? Yeah. Um, so today we're going to talk through our journey, so how we got to that, um, why we decided to use soft skills as our use case. Um, we'll talk through the three VR scenarios in a fair bit of detail. We'll look at our roadmap from now on, so 2020 and beyond. And we'll also cover our top tips. And a top tip for you is they're throughout the slides, but there is a slide at the end with all our top tips on. So don't feel like you have to take pictures as you go through. So question out to you guys. I was pretty cynical about the return on investment with VR when we started this journey. So I'm good, good. I'm, I've, I've been swayed in my opinion. So have a think about where you are. Clearly some of you are using VR. Do you just think it's for health and safety and life and death situations? Do you think it's for gamers and a bit of a fad? Um, do you just think it's too costly? Um, do you think it involves just too much specialist hardware? And like me, do you just think the return on investment may not stack up? Well, we're going to bust those myths through talking you through our journey with VR so, so far. And our aim for this session is really just to provide some help and support, and feel free to come up to us at the end and, and ask questions. So, Mark, over to you. Okay, thanks, Caroline. Um, okay, so I'm, I guess I'm guilty to an extent that whenever I see a new technology, I'm sort of wowed by it instantly. Regardless of what it is, that's great, that's fantastic, let's use it. Which made my job a little bit harder where my own boss wasn't really enamoured two years ago. Um, so firstly, why virtual reality? So learning and development within, uh, within Lloyd's Banking Group is really a key focus at the moment. We're, at the, we're part uh, of a three-year journey, um, and it's really about aiming to build the skills and capabilities of our workforce to equip them for the future, so to give our workforce the skills and capabilities they need for a digital world. So in order to transform the group for success in a digital world, we need to help build their capabilities. And to do that, we really need to offer a world-class, industry-leading learner experience, and virtual reality is part of that experience. So we've also been led by what our colleagues were telling us. So we surveyed, surveyed over 6,000 colleagues who generally told us that they want to learn out in work the way they learn outside of work. So they wanted to start seeing some of the technologies and seeing Lloyd's enhance and evolve and grow in terms of the technologies and the infrastructure that they use to learn with. And as I've mentioned, Virtuality is just part of our overall learning experience. So we started our journey back in January 2018, um, when Caroline was still not wowed by virtual reality. Um, so we formed a partnership uh, at that particular point with a recognised expert, so Make Real, who Robin is in the audience today. Uh, so I'll make sure I'm on point with my VR messages. Um, but we chose Make Real as our partner, and they were able to work with us to help show us the ropes, really, to help us learn the ropes. And that was absolutely critical, I think, to the success that Lloyd's has had in the whole VR space in just over two years since. Um, we went to, in order to be able to do this, we needed to put VR in front of senior leaders. We needed to put VR in front of our colleagues. And we needed to do that and say, yep, yeah, this is VR, this is a new media, it's still emerging at this particular time. So we needed to form the strategy, form the proposal. And we couldn't just go to our senior leaders, our colleagues, give them a VR headset and say, just go on this roller coaster, just climb this pole, just put out this fire, because there's no relevance to Lloyd's. So people say, yeah, VR's great, that's fun, really gimmicky, but where's the relevance to Lloyd's? It's not going to work in this industry. 
So we had to choose something that was relevant. Um, so we worked with Make Real. We developed a uh, proof of concept demonstrator, a very short experience, three or four minutes, that's all it was. And it was very simple in its approach. Um, but it was designed to be relevant to Lloyd's, to the types of things that happen in Lloyd's, colleague line manager on a day-to-day -day basis. We were able to put that in front of senior leaders. People started experiencing it. They wanted more. Um, and that's how we were able to grow, certainly the strategy within Lloyd's, by making sure the content firstly was relevant and how people could see that VR would really add value in an organisation like Lloyd's. And of course, remember, this is back in 2018, um, still feeling the effects, I guess, of the financial crisis, all of the legacy heritage issues that the bank had to deal with. Um, and we had to really sort of work with it uh, and continue to try and drive the group forward. So our first tip really is learn the ropes. Work with an expert that can help for and form your own strategy for this media. Okay, Caroline. Craig. Oh, Craig. So picture the scene for me. You've been going through a few stressful times lately. Life doesn't seem that fair right now. In fact, perhaps it seems that your job is the only stable element you've got going on in your life right now. And then you go into work one day and you find out there's rumours floating around the office that some sort of restructure is on the way and your job might be going. I would like you to meet Jonathan and his colleagues, the stars of our personal vitality and resilience scenario. Within Lloyds Banking Group, we take the issues of resilience and managing stress really, really seriously. And one of our most popular workshops is our personal vitality and resilience workshop. Thousands of colleagues attend it each year. But we had a real challenge. It was quite theory focused. It didn't really show practical, practically what resilience looks like. So we needed to find a really practical way of saying, here's what various states of resilience looks like. Here's what it looks like when things are going well. Here's what it looks like when things are going really badly. And here's what it looks like when you're in between. But we needed to do that in a way which maintained the kind of psychological safety of those people attending our workshops. And traditional learning methods, and trainers in the room, you'll be more than well aware of role play. Those of you who aren't trainers in the room will have gone through role plays, and there's a typical reaction to those, really weren't going to cut it. And other options that we looked at, such as bringing in actors to kind of act out a role play, is prohibitively expensive. So VR could really fill in that gap. It, was, it could provide something that no other training method could really do within a cost-effective way. And that leads us on to tip two, which is choose your use case. Think about where VR can add the most value and where you can demonstrate the greatest return on investment. So working with our supplier, we developed a 15-minute, completely bespoke, uh, a completely immersive scenario where delegates on our courses can go into an office. They meet six characters. Each of these six characters is having a range of different, um, um, a range of different emotions and a range of different reactions to the change scenario which is going on. And a change scenario uh, is very familiar to anyone who works in, in all different types of industries these, these days. Through the use of an interactive dialogue tree, Colleagues are able to interact with each of these characters, find out what they're thinking, what they're feeling, find out how they're reacting to the change, and find out how, uh, how other things in their personal lives are, are affecting them. And through going through this 15-minute experience, uh, they can see right there in front of them what different resilience states look like, how different people can have different reactions to the same situation. But they do so in a completely private way, in a way that allows them to fail safely, in a way that allows them to try out different strategies than they might otherwise have tried had they been facing a, a role play or a real life situation. Not only allowing them to see resilience, different resilient states, reflect on how that might affect them, but also think about if I come across a colleague in the future who's behaving like Jonathan or is behaving like any of the other characters, how might I deal with them differently uh, in the future? And that leads us on to our third tip. Don't be too ambitious. Yeah? This was a short scenario. 
about 150 character dialogue responses in it, about 15 minutes to get through. Start small, build up, build the case for VR in your organisation. Over to Caroline. Thanks, Craig. So what did colleagues say? So you've got some, some commentary here from colleagues. Um, generally, the commentary was really positive. We had a couple of people who experienced motion sickness, so she, you need to factor that in. You need to have something that's standalone outside of the fully immersive headsets. So that's something to bear in mind. Um, colleagues really t liked it. You know, a lot of people don't like role plays. I'm extrovert, and I still don't like role plays. Um, so that was a, a piece of feedback we got. Um, the other piece was it allowed them to fail safely and fail safely again and again and again. And there's no consequence of that. Um, so we also surveyed, so that was the kind of level one feedback we got, happy sheet type stuff. We also surveyed colleagues a few months later. Um, so we surveyed 500 colleagues that had gone through personal vitality and resilience. Um, and these were the results. So we had a 40% response rate. So 200 colleagues came back to us. Um, they talked about, you can see it's all really favourable, um, they talked about how effective it was, how relevant to their role it was, um, the actual impact it, it's had even months later, and also would they recommend the learning, but don't take my word for it, let's hear from some colleagues themselves within the bank. good fun. I was nervous to start off with, but as you got into it, it was almost as if I was there in the room with the customer. Really enjoyed it. Something new, something different and a good way of learning, I thought, definitely. Yeah, it's got great potential. It's brand new, it's a new innovation, it's a lot better than doing role plays. sessions like this, you normally do role plays with other delegates, you tend to work together so you can often be nice to each other and help each other out, whereas in the VR headset the uh, scenario is real. Loved it, really different, exciting, challenging way to, to learn. Okay. So I'm going to talk you through our next, uh, our next experience now, which came about six months later after our resilience experience. And this was on relationship management. It used a lot of the same principles as the resilience experience, but really took it to the next level. I think it's fair to say if we dipped our toe in the water with resilience, when it came to relationship management, we dived in head first. So for example, I mentioned that our first VR experience had 150 character responses in it. This next one had 1,500 character responses in it. It involved significantly upscaling the graphics and the animation, the facial features and the lip syncing to make the experience a great deal more immersive, to make it feel much more real. And also in, in, uh, involved a lot more feedback. So whereas in the first experience, Delegots got a very basic kind of amount of feedback as to how they did. In this experience, they get feedback on their outcome. They get feedback on the... Um, rapport they build with the characters and they also get to see a heat map of where their eye contact was so they can look at that. And with the relationship management experience we, we had four characters, you'll see them up here, and we built a series of 12 interactions uh, with each of these four characters, three each. Two of these were internal stakeholders, so dealing with your typical stakeholder meetings, meeting with other departments, meeting with other teams to talk about resourcing issues, prioritization. Two of them were external business clients. So for those colleagues who meet business clients on a daily basis could practice that, that skill. 
And because we built 12 interactions, we were able to use this in a whole variety of different uh, learning interventions, really ramping up the, the return on investment. So the 12 interactions are built, but we use different parts of those in different ways uh, in different scenarios because they're all designed to work together or independently. That's quite a challenge when it comes to writing the scripts and the dialogues, but if you get it right, it can really work for you. So it uses, it's used in stakeholder management, it's used in negotiations, it's used in psychological type, and it's used in uh, managing relationships with external business clients. And it was an absolute deliberate choice on our part to make this part of a face-to-face -face workshop. And that's because digital learning, great, face-to-face -face learning, great, put them together, you get something really, really special. And having a trainer there to debrief adds an enormous amount of value. It really doesn't matter how people do when they go through these scenarios. We're not measuring how well they do. It's all about their reflections and their experience. If they do great, that's fantastic. You've done great. Take that away, use those things. If you do badly, no worries. There's a trainer right there in the room to debrief with you to, so you can find out why you didn't do so well and what you can do differently next time. So it really is all about creating this culture where you can fail safely. You can try out different strategies. So this is part of one of our programs for our, our, our relationship managers who meet business clients all around the country on a daily basis. They're able to come in, they're able to see what of their current strategies work well and what have they been doing for years that maybe just isn't going to work so well again and what could they try that's different. And again, it's a private experience, it's in the headset, no one's watching what they're doing, so they can afford to take that risk that they might not ordinarily take and they can see what's working and what's not working. So our fourth tip for you today is really consider your return on investment. How can you get the most bang for buck out of your VR? How can you design an experience that can go into as many different learning interventions as possible? One final thing before I hand over is if you fancy your, uh, fancy your uh, skills at managing relationships and meeting difficult clients, do pop down to the Make Real stand downstairs so you can have a demo of this and try it out. Over to Caroline. Thanks. So at this point, we've done two VR scenarios, one to go. Um, I think it's really important when we, we went with relationship management, we realised we needed to increase interest and curiosity around the business. So not only did we need to upskill learning colleagues to recognise what would be a good use case, which in these examples is behavioural change, but also for people in the business to recognise that. So we attended a number of group wide events. So we've actually got one next um, month called Helping Britain Prosper. That's our strategic mission as a group, um, where a significant number of colleagues go to that. And we, we did that last year with VR and we went, well, 500 colleagues sampled these experiences then. So we have taken it out of the classroom and people have sampled it within those kind of events. Um, so that's our fifth tip is raise interest and curiosity in the media. And you can see there the kind of things we're, we're starting to look into. So we, we'll talk about presentation skills next, cybersecurity, difficult conversations, mental health, and EI. So over to you, Mark. Great, thanks, Caroline. OK, so let me introduce you to our third VR experience that we're just, uh, we're just launching as we speak, really. So this is all around delivering business presentations. So I think Helen alluded to this uh, a little bit earlier on. So imagine that you are delivering an important presentation. It's probably a nerve-wracking experience for a lot of people. You're walking into a room, you walk in front of senior leaders or any colleagues, um, and you don't, know, you don't quite know what reaction you're going to get. How receptive are they going to be? How likeable are they going to be? How interested are they going to be? Um, so we've, as part of our two-day face-to-face workshop, have introduced a Delivering Business Presentations course. So you also have a time limit to deliver your presentation. You can sideload your own individual presentation to this as well. And weird things start to happen and th things can start to go wrong. Um, so we'll just do a little visual in a second as to what the visual experience looks like. Um, but start, things start to happen, things start to go wrong in your presentation. It's how you can actually deal with them in the moment. Um, and then there's a big, a lot of powerful metrics behind the scenes that we'll cover as we go through. So Caroline? 
Okay, so you first of all start off in a corridor, giving you some really important introductory information, really showing you how to use the handsets, how to use the controllers. Um, you then walk into the, into the training room, into the meeting room, and you are greeted by six friendly people. And one of the people is Jonathan, who, who Craig mentioned has been our sort of star of our three experiences so far. Um, so you move into the, into the meeting room, and depending on which level you've selected, you'll get a different reaction each time. They're all welcoming, they're all looking at you, they're not multitasking, they're not doing other things. You can now deliver your presentation. It's tracking your eye contact, your eye movement, it's tracking your, your volume, your tone, your intonation. You can then replay your experience, so you'll move now to the back of the room, and you'll be able to watch yourself back in reality. Um, you can also then look at some metrics. So the metrics will show you how long you spent looking at each character to make sure you're even in terms of where you're addressing the audience. It covers your speaking length, your volume of your voice, how much time you spent looking at your slides, your hand gestures, your hand movements, your volume, your intonation, all of this is tracked. It tells you your filler words, so does everyone, anyone have like filler words that you just automatically say? Where are your movements, so where were you literally tracking, where were your head movements? Again, your eye contact. So there are lots of metrics that really sit behind this presentation that really makes it quite powerful. Um, and in the context of this particular workshop, it's used at the start of the course and at the end of the course, so learners can really see the journey they've come on just in the two days to go from where they started from to where they finished. And the other beauty of this presentation, as Craig's mentioned with the other two experiences, they're very much designed to be part of a face-to-face -face workshop. This can really operate standalone, so that it's designed to be used within the workshop and have the learning of the facilitation wrapped around that, but also to be used that anybody can just drop into a room, put the VR headset in, load in their own presentation and practice right at the point that they need it. So in summary, we've now successfully launched three fully immersive VR experiences that now span multiple courses across multiple locations within the UK. Um, and this one has been done in conjunction with e-learning studios, um, who are also demonstrate, demoing this downstairs in the exhibition, so pop along to their stand if you'd like to experience that exact experience. Okay, so e-learning studios, e-learning studios. <coughs> Okay, so looking then at um, the virtual reality tools and kit. So of course, virtual reality relies very heavily on technology and hardware, and this really is crucial in terms of your strategic direction about which way, where does your investment go, where does your budget go, to make sure you're investing in the right kit for your needs. Um, so as I mentioned, it requires and relies heavily on hardware and technology, and there are a whole host of headsets, VR capability that you can, that you can get you've probably experienced a lot of them. So smart, starting from things like smartphone VR, so things like Google Cardboard, um, Samsung Gear, etc., just literally driven by the smartphone. That's one end of the scale, really. Through to mobile VR, so example of that is the Oculus Go, lightweight, portable, you put the headset on, it doesn't require anything else, it's just the one standard unit. It comes with the one controller. That's typically been our staple uh, hardware that we've used to date so far. Very easy to use, as we saw in the video, 14 delegates all in the classroom were able to use that all at exactly the same time, know what to do. Um, and I think one of the key pieces of feedback that we found from learners as we've gone along this journey really, is that some of our colleagues, and you might find this yourselves, are quite nervous about putting the headset on. They, they're really nervous about, are they gonna break it? What do they do? Um, and they're sort of scared to move. They don't want to move. And we, we saw this even this week in demonstrating. So again, as we've gone along with our experiences, I guess we can't iterate enough the importance of making it as clear and easy as possible with constant voice prompts about telling colleagues what to do, even if it's sort of Janet and John speak, if you like, really, really important so that the colleague can feel confident and comfortable in the headset without feeling stupid or without feeling as though it's a fool or anything like that. So that is, is sort of really important. The other third device, standalone devices. So these are headsets that offer a greater degree of immersion. So the Oculus Go, the mobile one, is the three degrees of freedom, tracks head and, uh, and, body and, and eye movement, whereas the standalone devices is the new Oculus Quest, really an example of that. And finally, at the far end of the scale, is the tethered devices. So these are headsets that need to be tethered 
to a high-powered PC or a laptop, also has to put sensors and things like that as well. So that's one end of the scale. So one thing to remember to make VR a success in your organisation is to make it scalable. We started off with the Oculus Go and we started with the Oculus Rift. We quickly ditched the Oculus Rift, if you like. We bought three of those devices. It didn't work for us. Um, we bought the Oculus Go's. They work brilliantly. And if we didn't have the Oculus Go's, VR probably would have failed in Lloyd's because the Rift was too logistically challenging in the context that we were using it. We were using it day in, day out by trainers as part of a classroom. It wasn't a bespoke individual event used at conferences. Um, so, that, so Oculus Go was our uh, hardware of choice, really. And then in the summer of 2019, a potential game changer through the Oculus Quest. Um, a much cheaper version, similar to the Oculus Rift, much cheaper, retailing at five or six hundred pounds, that gives you that full immersive experience, that full body movement immersive experience. We've invested in 24 more of these Oculus Quest devices. We're going to invest in more of that. Um, and certainly Oculus themselves are, are sort of edging, pushing in that direction in terms of the Quest. So it's just really to, I guess, reiterate that the hardware and the technology is now really, really affordable. Oculus Go's retailing £200-ish, Oculus Quest roughly around £500, £600, so well within the sort of realms of, of budget, if you like. So our tip seven, keep the technology simple and easy to use, make sure you give sort of regular signposts over to colleagues, and choose your hardware based on the nature of your experiences. So if the nature of your experience is typically soft skill, warrant the Oculus Go, that's fine, and that's exactly what we've experienced, because we don't necessarily need, as I mentioned with the Oculus Rift, that full immersive experience for the nature of some of the experiences that we've developed so far. Okay, Caroline. Okay, so um, we've talked through our three VR scenarios, given you some tips. Um, so what's next for us? So really embedding what we've done already, that's really important this year. We've got about 100 headsets, we just need to expand on that, so expand our hardware. Um, we need to consider some content development options. So at the moment, we've gone down the buy strategy. So I want to explore, actually, from a new build perspective, is it better to buy or actually get some in-house development going on? And similarly, uh, maintenance-wise, is it a buy versus internal build? And what authoring tools are out there to, to enable that? We're going to explore multiplayer, multi-location VR experiences. And we also, we also want to explore um, using VR outside the classroom. So I think presentation skills is probably the one example that we've shown you where you could see how that could work outside of the classroom, given the right environment. Um, and we also want to explore other use cases. So how can we use what we've learned in these three scenarios and continue <coughs> to develop, mainly focusing on that behavioral change for us as a bank? So Mark, back over to you. Okay. Um, so making the financials work. So as I've mentioned, VR really doesn't have to cost the earth. We talked about hardware. There are two key components really to make VR work, the hardware and the content. So we'll just focus quickly on the content. If you just go back oh yeah. slide, Caroline. Just focus on the, the content first of all. Um, so three ways potentially that, uh, that you could look to sort of reinvest, save money on a longer term basis. So firstly, off-the-shelf content. This is growing. So VR is still a relatively new media in some contexts, especially in the soft skill arena. Um, so look, explore off-the-shelf content. Can that off-the-shelf off the content be tailored and adapted to your organization? <coughs> Quite simple to brand it your organization. You put it to learners, they think it's a bespoke build. Um, so consider off-the-shelf content. Characters, look to reuse existing characters. So if you work with, if you identify a partner, as we've done with Mate Real in particular, if you identify a partner that you work with, work with that partner on an ongoing basis to look to see where you've got cost efficiencies. What can you use in terms of reusing characters, reusing environments, you reusing components so you're not always starting from scratch again in terms of build. And finally, our experiences so far have all been CGI, so they've all been computer generated, they've been graphic based. Um, but consider maybe using 360 degree video as well. So a lot we've found in our experience that a lot of the, the cost, the development time, the build time, et cetera, is typically in the computer generated graphic space. 
So the lip syncing, the facial expressions, the intricacies in relation to the characters that you are working with, that you are engaging with as part of the experience. Okay. Craig. Okay. So wherever you are on your VR journey, whether you're using VR right now oh, or you're just starting out, we, no, next slide, please. <laughs> they want to take a picture of that. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> or you, Craig, they want to take a picture of that. Yeah. <laughs> Fine. There you go. Correct. Sorry. This is what happens when you put me in charge of the slider, isn't it? <laughs> Did everyone manage to get that? Cool, I'll start again. Uh, <laughs> so wherever you are in your VR journey, whether you're using VR right now or whether you're starting, uh, starting to think about using it, we'd like to leave you with a few parting thoughts. And I think we'll start with what we consider the golden rule of VR, which is don't get wowed by the tech. If you want to use VR because it's new, it's shiny, it looks good, and it's different, do not do that. Do not do that. You really need to think about where VR can add the most value. So our final thoughts are, firstly, how can you get most value for money out of VR? How can you really bring in new things that otherwise could not be done in a, in a learning environment? Like, for example, meeting an external client within our relationship management experience. The only way really to get close to that is to go and meet an external client. Role play just doesn't cut it. How can you make it real? How can you make the environment, the scenarios, as real as possible? A huge amount of effort with our experiences went into making the environments look like Lloyds Banking Group offices, making the dialogue sound like things that people in Lloyds Banking Group say. The more immersive you can make it, the more real you can make it, the more people learn. I've literally had people tear off a headset and say, oh, don't like him. Right, they're talking about virtual characters but they, they, they're in that emotion. That leads to the next point. VR, for me, is unparalleled in emotional engagement. For those of you who are learning professionals, I take it that's most of us, you will know it's very easy to intellectually engage delegates in a training or a learning environment, but getting them to experience the same emotions in a learning environment they do outside a learning environment is tricky. VR can really help you do that. I've seen it over and over again. Also think about the characters. How can you make those characters as real as possible? Yeah? That's partly down to the, uh, the VR developer you use. Find someone who can really get great looking characters with great emotion, great lip syncing, great facial expressions. That will help. So it's partly a technical challenge, but it's partly a challenge in terms of how you design your experience, how you design those characters, and how you design the dialogue. One step we took really early in our VR journey was that all the dialogue got written in-house in Lloyd's Banking Group because we know how people sound in our industry as you know how people sound in your industries. Fail safely, as we've said. Find scenarios where people can make mistakes they're ordinarily not allowed to make. This has been used in VR for years, you know. Airline pilots don't get to make mistakes when they're actually, behind the actually in the cockpit. But how can you apply that to your industry? Be radical as well. Think differently. Think what VR could bring in a learning environment that's never been done in your learning environment before. Think about measurements. Our experience is delegates like measurements. They don't want to go through a VR scenario and just be, told, just be asked, how was that for you? What did, how did you get on? They want some empirical measurement. They want some, they want some feedback on their experience. So build that right in at the start. Trust me, it's a lot easier building it in the start than getting to the end and thinking about how we're going to measure this experience. And lastly, do consider the logistics. Mark's talked a lot about the different headsets and the different equipment. That can really derail you if you don't give that thought right from the start. Where are the headsets going to be stored? How many are you going to need? How are you going to keep them secure? How are you going to upskill your trainers on how to use them? How are you going to let delegates know how to use them? How quickly can you get delegates into a... You don't want to be spending 20 minutes setting up the headsets uh, in a training experience. That will turn your delegates right off. So that's our presentation. We'd be delighted to answer any questions that you have. But perhaps before we do that, perhaps you can just have a chat with the colleagues who have come with you, have a little think about how can you use VR in your industry, what challenges might help, what, how, what challenges do you have that VR can help with, 
and then we'd be really happy to answer your questions. Um, just, yeah, just a couple of minutes if you want to just discuss that and then we'll, uh, we've got some time for the questions just straight after that. Okay, um, who would like to start the questioning off? I've got one over there, I've got one over here. I'll, I'll come okay. first. Oh my God, that's <laughs> good. I'm going to be doing some running here. Hi, um, Mike, you talked about scalability. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, that's yeah. better. Yeah. Um, you talked about scalability. Is your, um, are your courses mainly done in the UK or have you scaled that globally? And have you got experience globally in doing that? Yeah. <laughs> So, so I'll probably pick. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so Lloyds Banking Group is obviously a, a primarily a UK, a UK bank. Uh, so yes, our courses have been done uh, in the UK up until this point. We are looking into um, how we can do courses in other locations. In particular, uh, we've got courses in the islands of Jersey, the Isle of Man. Uh, however, what I will say is there are challenges with currying VR kit. They've got lithium ion batteries and it sounds like is that what's holding me back? Yes, but that is what it will hold you back. Certain <laughs> couriers won't take it. So to do that, you really have to establish bases of kit where you want to do the, the learning, is what I would say. Just carting it around the country is a whole pain in the certain areas. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. um, for your first scenario, which is looked like the test, did you run a parallel on a non-VR platform, um, like a, a tablet, and if so, what were the marked differences in between the learner feedback for the VR and non-VR? Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah, we, we had a laptop version. So we had in entirely the same scenario. So we had a, a, a fully 360 VR. We had a laptop version, which was exactly the same scenario. Exactly everything was the same, except it was on a, on a laptop. Feedback generally was most overwhelming majority preferred the, the headset because it was just much more immersive. You're, you're in there, you're surrounded, you can look all the way around. Uh, it's particularly immersive if you use headphones. Uh, the, the Oculus Go does have an inbuilt speaker, speaker, but if you use headphones, you get that 360 audio as well. However, I would say a small percentage, and I would put it at no more than 5% of people, do prefer the laptop uh, in order to uh, overcome the uh, motion sickness element that some people experience. And I think just to sorry, just to add on to that that point as well, within the headset you can of course record the experience as well. So that will output as an MP4 video file. You can take away and so and that's you can do that in house. You don't need any supplier to do that for you, and that's available just directly through the headset. Um, and I'm being greedy. I've got two questions. Um, the first of which is, apart from learner feedback, how, how else has your return on investment been demonstrated? And the second one was, have you had to retrain your training deliverers? Um, to integrate VR into their lesson planning? Can I answer the second question first? <laughs> <laughs> so, how, have we had to retrain? Uh, yes, but that retraining is really quite uh, minimal, in my view. Uh, the way we, uh, so I'm one of the managers in the learning delivery team, and uh, as I said, uh, you know, I, I would guess about 80% of the workshop remains standard training delivery that our, learn, our trainers are more than familiar with. So yeah, there was an upskill process in terms of how to use the VR kit, how to troubleshoot a few things. I would say that's no more than about, I think the trainers we had picked it up in about an hour. And there might be some trainers that need a little bit of extra help, but you're not talking a huge upskill. The Oculus Go in particular is virtually foolproof. Yeah, the, s the second part of the question is... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Return on investment. <laughs> yeah. um, yeah, so I guess in terms of return on investment, it's always, a, I guess, a tricky one to be tangible. Um, so first, I think what I would say is that the demand and the appetite from learners <coughs> in terms of learner engagement, appetite, the knowledge that they then take away and have demonstrated. So the, the survey that Caroline mentioned 
earlier on in the presentation, that was, that was captured about four to five months after the delegates had attended the course. So that gave us one degree barometer in terms of how they are able to remember the experience. And one of the key things and benefits of VR, it's memorable. So you're able to memorize, remember the experience much more than you would in a role play, which of course is very staged, very fictitious. Um, so you are able to remember that, take that forward. Um, and we have seen evidence of that in the live environment with learners, colleagues mm. taking that back into into BAU. Yeah. I, I would add to that, so the resilience experience we designed was never really meant to be, we're getting a huge benefit you know, financially out of it. It was meant to show, here's what resilience looks like, here's how you can better manage your stress. That's not something that's really return on investment you know, design. Mm -hmm. However, the relationship manager experience will absolutely um, be focused on return on investment because it's going out to our, 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 our yep. client managers uh, they, they're on a program which includes this VR, and part of that will be capturing how is, how is that helping them in their role, what greater returns are they, are, they, are they generating. But we're a little bit early in our journey to come along with more figures on that right now. I think if we came back next year, we could probably say, yes, here's what it is. So I did some stats, because I like a bit of measurement. Um, so we should get about 2,500 colleagues through the VR experiences embedded within courses by the end of this year. That works out about £100 per person, and that cost will reduce over time. The more people use it, the more people, the cost will come down. So that gives you some kind of indication in terms of cost per person. Great presentation, really interesting. I'm interested in the internal efforts. You're talking a lot about the return, but you had thousands of scenarios that you've created and situations. You didn't knock that up in an afternoon. Uh, you're absolutely right, yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah, it, it is an effort. Um, it, it does require an investment on time. I would, I would say this as, as the person who's probably written most of the dialogue. It's a certain type of skill, and even people who are very creative and are used to writing scripts, you know, linear scripts, can struggle with it because you're not writing one story, you're writing about five or six stories that all work in parallel. Uh, so it, it's going to be a bit of a process, it's going to be a learning curve. I think that's why we started simple. Doing it on the really simple, you know, 150 bits of dialogue experience enabled us then to scale up. But yes, it does take time. So how many hours would you say, based on what you've shown us, Oh, that's a great question. I, uh, lots. <laughs> uh, if you give me ten, 10 minutes to think about it afterwards, I might come up with a figure. But on the okay. off the top of my head, I, I didn't. Yeah, it's significant. Yeah, yeah. Days and days and days and days. Yeah. And in terms of development time, three to four months per scenario. Yeah, I'd say that. I'd say that's fair. But that's getting faster all the time because mm. the the suppliers we work with actually learnt a lot through doing this for us. I think it, what what we have to say is these types of scenarios really haven't been done before. Mm. So the suppliers were learning at the same time we and were learning. And we're learning as well. And we're learning so. as well. So now it would be faster. And I, I think just to, just to build on to that point around the suppliers and the vendors, the previous session, I think in this, in this track an hour or so ago, was talk about vendors who maybe, I guess, are fairly newer, uh, maybe been around five or six years, something like that. And, and that's exactly what we found with the, with the VR experiences. The vendors are working with you, they're learning with you as well. So they're on the journey with you and that's great because they're so flexible, adaptive, um, and that's definitely the vendors. And with VR being such a new media, there's a lot of opportunities there to really work with different suppliers, different vendors, and learn and work with them. And they'll really push the boundaries as well. Uh, my question is regarding the maintenance. Um, when you have changes to what you have created there, does it mean uh, you need to redo the whole thing or can you go back and uh, change certain bits and pieces? Because as a story is building on yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, what you yeah. click here yeah. and then you go there yeah. and then you go there. So it may yeah. be very disruptive if you just take out bits and pieces. Sure. Well, uh, luckily for us, most of it's fairly generic at the moment. But yeah. yeah, that's definitely something I've got a question on this year in terms of actually, do we buy in an authoring tool? Do we use our suppliers to do the maintenance? Do we, buy, do we recruit people who can do Unity software coding, basically, to do yeah. it in-house? That's a question for this year. I'll, I'll add to that and say, yes, it is updatable. You don't need to change the whole thing to update <coughs> one thing. I think we learned a really valuable experience on, the, on our first one in that I, put my hand up here, put in the name of a system that we use in, in LBG, and that system then got canned. So we had to go back and change that bit of dialogue. 
So lesson learned in the next one, it's all generic dialogue and therefore the, the scope for certain things changing. Uh, so, so for me, you know, uh, VR's great with the more generic you can keep the dialogue, the easier it's going to be maintenance wise. But if you're going to put in a lot of specifics, then yeah, maintenance might be an issue. Yeah. This one here. Um, fabulous, really enjoyed that, thank you. Um, what is, thinking about the multi-person environment, what's your utopia look like for that? What do you consider, oh wow, if we can get to that with a group of people having a shared virtual reality experience interacting with each other? Have you ever thought about like, if we could, you know, if time and money was no object, where would we like to go to? I think it's a great question. I think it's really relevant because of the whole climate change sustainability agenda. And we know Larry Fink sent that, that letter to all of the CEOs that he invests, BlackRock invests in during Davos. So it's on everyone's agenda to think of our sustainability. And I can see the whole multiplayer piece really, really working in that space. So we've had numerous calls with stakeholders. I don't think we've got a strategy yet in that space. There's some time yeah. restrictions you've got to apply to it as well. You can't have people in headsets for too long. Um, Craig, anything to add? Yeah, I mean, so I had a meeting uh, just a couple of weeks ago in Altspace, and, and there's various platforms where you can meet in VR, and they, they look great, but right now I think they're social platforms that they're designed to, to kind of meet up socially. For me, a, a great learning space would like a space where people from many different parts of the country could meet in VR. You could have uh, bespoke content uploaded, whether that be video, uh, slides, uh, audio, have the ability to break out into smaller groups uh, and have the ability for, for polls uh, and, and various other things in there. Uh, I don't, I'm not aware of anything right now that, that does that, but I would love to see it, uh, or actually I'd, I'd just love to build it. Actually, we might well <laughs> build it, who knows? So. Okay, um, I'm very aware of the time and also that we're holding you back from a drinks reception downstairs. <laughs> Nothing to do with that, obviously. Um, if there are any other questions, uh, I guess the guys, you are yeah. happy to, to yeah. take them as well um, after the session. Um, but I'd, I'd just like you to, to thank again um, Helen Dudfield, uh, like Caroline McCarthy, and Mark Paul and Craig Piper for their brilliant presentation. Thank you.